Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate you sharing that. And good morning, Stonebridge. Happy New Year. Good to see you. My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's my delight to welcome you here. How are you doing at keeping your New Year's resolutions? Got real quiet in the room when I asked that. It, it's uh, inevitable, isn't it? We, we may come up with New Year's resolutions. The most popular are losing weight, getting into shape. Um, we try to reduce stress. You know, we may have all kinds of goals. The problem is that I've noticed is that in designing New Year's resolutions, that can add more stress to my life than take it away because now I've got extra things I'm trying to pack into my life. And a friend of mine said, I feel like a gerbil. You know, you get into one of those little cages and you're spinning around and you're not going anywhere. But here's something to think about. Did you know that God has a New Year's resolution for you? He has a goal for you and me. And it is to enter into His rest. That's a goal that could be life-changing. In fact, my prayer is that today would be a life-changing moment for you. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 4. The book of Hebrews is in the New Testament, so if you brought a Bible, you want to go in and look toward the back of the Bible, toward the end. If you didn't bring a Bible, we have them on the rack in front of you, page 1002, Hebrews chapter 4. It's okay to bring out your cell phone, your iPad, and uh, pull that up. Hebrews chapter 4. We're in a series that we're calling The Journey because the writer of Hebrews really has given us a sermon manuscript. It's written by a brilliant fellow who's able to use the ancient story of the ancient Israelites in contemporary fashion in his day to make a point about the fact that uh, to endure in life as a Christ follower, we need an accurate view of Jesus. That's one of the big messages in this book, that the more clearly you see who Jesus is and what he's done for you, the more you'll be able to endure as a Christian. He's writing to people who live in the first century. We believe they're second generation Christians, probably living in Rome, in part because of the evidence we see in the book of Hebrews. They're Jewish Christians, but because of the persecution they're suffering and the rejection from family, some of them are kind of backsliding, going back into their old religious beliefs. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to encourage them to persevere, and he highlights over and over again how great Jesus is. He's greater than the angels, as great as they are. He's greater than Moses, who is one of the key patriarchs of the Old Testament. He is an anchor. And what we're going to learn today is that uh, we, have, we are on a journey in life. In fact, you know, if you pull out the little bookmark, you see where we're going as we go through this study. The journey that we're on is reflected in the journey of the Israelites, If you're not familiar with that story, the Israelite people were captives. They were slaves of the people of Egypt. And God raised up Moses and brought ten plagues in order to help them escape from Egypt and to come into the promised land. Well, there are so many parallels between what they experienced and what we experience in our lives today that this becomes a great lesson for us. Like the Israelites, human beings are enslaved. Uh, We're enslaved, according to Scripture, to sin, which is thinking that we have better ideas than God, the devil, and to death. We're enslaved to those things. And we need rescuing. And so in the ancient Israel, they they killed a lamb and put uh, blood on the doorpost so that when the angel of death came to uh, take the firstborn children of the Egyptians, he would pass over the Israelites. Well, we have an a a lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As they struggled along 40 years in the wilderness, we struggle along, and though they failed by not trusting in God, he encourages us, the writer of Hebrews, to stay strong in our trust and our walk with Jesus. So it's the journey. 
And I think this is going to be a very encouraging, including the message today, which is God's goal for you and me is to enter into his rest. In fact, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, strive to enter that rest. Be diligent to take advantage of it. So if your Bibles are open with mine, let's read that. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as it came to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's quoting Psalm 95 there although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And again in the passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter, because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Well, Father, this is a rich passage filled with meaning, and we're going to need your help, Lord, to understand it and even more to apply it to our lives. So be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're going to look at is two things. One is, what does it mean, God's rest? What does that term mean? And secondly, how do we strive to enter it? Uh, I don't know about you, but I read that, and it was kind of a surprise to me. He says, enter my rest, and he defines entering the rest as ceasing from labor. And then you get to verse 11, and he says, so strive to enter it. I think that's kind of a paradox. I'm supposed to... Not work, but enter it, but then I'm supposed to work to enter it. So how in the world does that work? So let's begin with what is the rest of God, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll get into three steps to entering it in verses 11, 12, and 13. What is the rest of God? Well, we know from Scripture, and especially verses 1 and 2 here, that the rest of included the literal land of Canaan. God promised Israel to bring them into a new land, a land of rest. If you read the first five books of the Old Testament, you come to the book of Deuteronomy, and several times God is talking about rest in the new land of Canaan, rest from enemies, rest from the hard labor of slavery with the Egyptians. God has promised a physical reality of rest in the land of Canaan. But we see here that he warns us to be afraid lest we fail to enter it. A whole generation, we learned last week, died in the wilderness in those 40 years because they didn't trust in God and exercise an active faith. And he's, as a good pastor, he's warning us, Don't follow that bad example. Learn a good lesson from a bad example. Rest comes through faith. 
But he also says there's something more here than the literal meaning of the land of Canaan. He tells us in verses 3 through 7 that it was on the seventh day of creation that God rested. He's quoting Genesis chapter 2 here. God created this beautiful world. And on the seventh day, he looked back, he said, this is beautiful, this is good. And God rested on the seventh day. So there was a rest that God offered to invite us into from the very beginning of human recorded history. Now that rest that God gave us is not like the rest I was looking for as a child. My mother would say to me, Randy, go clean your room. And I would say, okay. And so I would go in and I would clean my room. And from the outside, it looked pretty good. The bed was made, kind of, and toys were gone, picked up, the desk was clear, closet was shut. And I figured, I've done my work, six days of labor, and I'm going to rest, which for me meant trying to find the television and, and watch cartoons. But then my mother would come in to the room, and she'd look around and begin her inspection. And that often included pulling open drawers filled with all kinds of clothing, some used, some, you know, clean, and toys. And she'd look under the bed, and she'd see a mess. And uh, often she would be careful opening the closet because you could lose your life because things would fly out at you in the closet. Now, she would come to me and she would say, your work is not done. There is no rest for the wicked. That was the first Bible verse I learned. No rest for the wicked. And so I'd go back in. Now, some people have that view and they say, God rested on the seventh day. Okay, he finished his work, kind of sat down in the recliner and, and put his feet up and, and just relaxed and and his work wasn't really done. But that's not it. God had given humanity a wonderful gift of Sabbath. In fact, as you read through the ancient scriptures of the Old Testament, you see he said to keep that one day holy, one day in seven, where you remind yourself that your employer does not own you. God owns you. And he gave you one day in seven to be rest, rested, refreshed, You didn't have to go out and look for manna on that day. You could just be refreshed and renewed. Now, of course, uh, Christians don't observe a seventh day of rest. We often talk about Sunday being the first day of the week, being a day of rest, because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday. When I was a pastor in Rock Valley, northwest Iowa, I was so impressed with the farmers in our church. Many of them had huge farms, cattle operations, And on Sundays, they would do the minimum required chores that had to be done, keep the cattle fed, but they refused to go out in the fields. And that just stunned me because farming is such a weather-related occupation. And, you know, during harvest season, it just you go until uh, dawn to dusk and sometimes all night long. But they refused to work on Sundays not because of a legalistic standard, but they believed that God had blessed that day and they wanted to be rejuvenated in it. But here's the problem, isn't there? God has established this one day in seven, but let's face it, we have such a difficult time entering into that rest. Case in point, in these few verses, he makes a reference to what happened in Numbers chapter 14. This is also in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis says, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. In chapter 14, Moses was leading the people out of the wilderness, and God said to Moses, you're almost at the promised land. Send out 12 spies. Pick one from each tribe. Send them in the land. And so Moses did that. 12 spies went out. They went into the land of Egypt, into the land of Canaan, and they came back with an amazing report of abundant fruit, fruit so abundant that people carrying it had a hard time. You know, those pomegranates can get pretty, pretty heavy. And they just described the bounty of this land. But then 10 of the 12 spies exercised what we would call the majority report. They said, hey, But there's a huge problem. 
we have giants in the land. They are huge people, strong. In fact, they said, when we looked at them, we felt like grasshoppers, which is where the term grasshopper complex came from. We can't go in there. Now, there were two men, Caleb and Joshua by name. And they, they stepped forward. They were two of the 12 spies. They said, oh, let's give the minority report. We just came out of Egypt. We just saw God do 10 amazing plagues and set us free from the Egyptians. Miracle. God can do anything. Let us go in and take the land of Canaan. But as you know, the 10 spy majority report won the day. And that's why in Psalm 95, we come back to that statement, today is the day, and the day came for them. And they said, God, you might have a desire for us, but we have a better idea. We don't want to be killed. And for the next 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, over 600,000 People died in the wilderness until the next generation came up and finally entered the land. So here we have God offering this rest. It's deeper than the land itself, but it's entering the rest by trusting in God and what He says, doing what He says. But we have a different idea, and so we constantly struggle to enter the rest because of our disobedience based on disbelief. Now, a contemporary illustration of this would be health clubs. We just talked to somebody who runs a health club. And they said, we just love the Christmas season because people get motivated. New Year is coming. We need to get into shape. And they come into our doors, and they pay a lot of money to join the gym. And they may be faithful for the first week or two, and then where are they? But the health clubs don't care. They're making all kinds of money. But you see, we humans, we, we want to enter this rest. We want to do things in our own strength, but we constantly fail. See, so there's got to be another meaning of God's rest so that we can enjoy it. It's more than the land. It has to do with God's offer of rest. But thirdly, and this is where I think he gets into the meaning fulfilled in Christ in verses 8 through 10. It is the redemption of Jesus Christ, verses 8 to 10. Look at it again. He says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later on. Later on meaning in Christ. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For those who've entered God's rest have also rested from His works as God did His. Now here's the thing. When the Hebrew people heard the name Joshua, as they were reading this sermon, they would have heard Joshua, Yeshua, which is the Old Testament name, New Testament name is Jesus. They would have immediately linked Joshua, not giving them rest, with the Jesus who would give them rest. So what he's saying here is that the redemption of Jesus is what brings us into God's rest. Now, redemption is just a fancy word that just means to buy something back. Uh, in the Bible, it's often used of slavery in the Old Testament days. And even in the Bible days of the New Testament, people were often sold as slaves. And in the horror of our country, back in the Civil War days, where people were actually sold. And they would be put on a block, and people would bid on them, and then they would buy them. Well, that imagery was used to describe the work of Jesus. That through His death on the cross, God becoming a human being, through His death, He atoned for our sins, He paid the penalty for our sins, and through His resurrection proved He's really God, and through that action bought us from the slave block of sin and death and the devil. Jesus Christ is the greater Joshua. But I want you to notice here, he says we enter it through faith. We cease from our efforts and we rest in Christ. Now, how does that work? 
Well, I think this redemption in Christ can be portrayed best in the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 11. In Matthew 11, Jesus is talking to some of his friends and he says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now I want you to notice what Jesus says. Where do we find rest? Does he say, come to a set of doctrinal statements? Now we just sang that great song, I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. We believe. But some people base their whole Christian faith just on a set of beliefs, and it's only in their brains. Jesus says, no, come to me. Notice he doesn't say, "Come come to a church. Now we would admit church is a place to grow. That's where we walk together. That's why we have life groups. But he doesn't say, come to the church. He doesn't say, come to a psychologist. It's not that psychologists aren't valuable. And we believe in biblical counseling in this church. And we offer it. But Jesus doesn't say, come to a counselor. And notice, he doesn't say, come to some warm spot south of the equator to get warm. Now, that'd be a good thing to do. Nothing wrong with a vacation. Going somewhere warm. Sitting on a beach. Getting sunburned. I mean, that sounds attractive to me right now. But the problem is, with a vacation, is that then you've got to come back and freeze to death in Iowa. And you've got to go back to work. So, you see, he's not saying, don't do these things. He's saying, come to me. That's why we say, it's not a prayer that saves you. You know, you might have grown up as a child and you prayed some prayer in a church program. That's not it. He says, come to me. It's Jesus who saves. Come to me. Now you say, well, I'm trying to come to Jesus, but his yoke is heavy. I, I'm, I've got problems in my life. Problems in my marriage, problems at work, problems with my kids. I, life is tough. So how can we be yoked and find rest. Well, here's how it works. In the days of the Bible, they would do farming, not with the fancy tractors we have that are GPS run. They did that with oxen. And what they would do is they would take an older, experienced oxen who could plow a straight furrow, and they would yoke that older oxen, more experienced, with a younger oxen who was just learning. And I can just imagine it. you got this strong muscled oxen and he's going forward and got hooked to him some youngster and he's looking around and he's seeing rabbits and he's saying things and he's being pulled along he's, he doesn't know what he's doing but he's being pulled along by this older oxen sometimes they hit a dip you know a little furrow in the ground and, and his feet aren't even touching the ground he's just trying to get along and he's yoked to this strong oxen that is the image here. Jesus is the strong, experienced oxen. So when we are yoked to him, when we put our play, faith and trust in him, he carries us. He makes our yoke easy. I was thinking of that the other day. I, you know how it is. Some, sometimes you do this too. You, you think, oh, there, there's so many things I've got to do. That there's anxieties I have. They may keep you up at night. And I found myself one early morning with my cup of coffee and my Bible, and uh, I'm wrestling with this with God. And in my reading that day, I came to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on Him, for He cares for you. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you that I can release these things to you. You care. No matter how tough my days are in my own perception, you carry me. I'm yoked to you. You see how that works? That's how we enter in to the rest of Jesus Christ that fills our soul. Now, ultimately, that rest will issue forward in a day of eternal rest in the presence of God. Uh, If I had time, I'd go into Revelation 
Uh, I've got a verse here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, where it talks about we enter an eternal rest. When people say rest in peace, they mean resting in the presence of God. So ultimately, there's an eternal rest. But I believe because the author keeps referring to Psalm 25, to, or Psalm 95, today is the day, today is the day, today is the day. He's trying to get into our brains that in our walk through this desert we call life, Jesus Christ is with us. One of the most common terms in the book of Hebrews is partakers or sharers or that we're companions of Jesus. He calls us brothers and sisters. We're walking along life with him, yoked to him. That is the rest that God provides right now in this season where we live in the already of his kingdom, but the not yet of his eternal kingdom. Now you're thinking, well, <clears throat> I want to get there, but how? How do I get there? Well, that's what the, these next three verses talk about. They talk about striving to enter the rest. The word striving means to be diligent, to give some effort to it. And you think, well, that's a paradox. How do I strive to cease from my labor and just trust in God? How does that work? Well, let's think about that. Strive to enter the rest. Number one, realizing that the danger is to miss it because of what? Disobedience. That's what he says here in verse 11. We must face our temptation to wander. Strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. He's hearkening back to Numbers 14 and Kadesh. There's a progression isn't there? We learn a lot from the children of Israel. First of all, there was the complaining. I do a lot of complaining myself. I ran right into that. And here were the people. Moses! 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 We're, we're not getting enough water. We don't have enough food. We miss our salads. We don't have our onions and leeks. We had that back in Egypt, you know? Moses! He says, why did you leave us out here? Do you want to kill us? Now see, it starts with complaining. We begin to develop a perception, a negative view of things. And we start to complain. And then what happens? Well, then, then we begin to question God. Because Moses, as soon as he hears that complaining, he takes it seriously. He falls on the ground praying to God for the people, pleading for God to forgive them. But what happens? the people begin to disbelieve God. They begin to question the goodness and power of God. They completely forget of the ten plagues that he brought and the freedom of the exodus. They forget it. They forget what he did. And they begin to disbelieve in God. And then when they begin to disbelieve in God, they come up with their own ideas. Maybe we know better than God. And then there's a hardening of the heart. We call that today backsliding. Well, I don't know that God can really do anything. And we begin to harden our heart, and we begin to get hardened. And we, I've seen this happen. People drop out of church, drop out of life groups. Pretty soon they're, they don't have any Christian friends anymore. They just, their circumstances get to the point where it leads them from complaining. There's a progression. Complaining to, to uh, disbelieving, to a hardening, and then disobeying. And he doesn't want us to go down that road. And so he says to us, strive to enter. And I think what he's implying here is be open with the fact that we all are susceptible to that temptation, that progressive downward spiral to disbelief and falling away. He's writing to Christians. So the best thing we can do when it comes to entering the rest is to come to Jesus Christ today and to say to him, Lord, I... I'm just like the Israelites. I'm a broken person. Please forgive me. Now you say, well, okay, I could do that. I could, I could do that, but that still seems kind of passive. Where's this active obedience that comes from it? Well, coming in confession and repentance is only one side of the coin. There also has to be an act of faith accompanying that. I love the story Billy Graham told not of the great 
Houdini, but the great Handini. This is a true story. I think it happened back in the 40s or 50s. Some crazy man thought he could stretch a wire across Niagara Falls and walk across it. Now, some guy has done that recently, I think, in the last five years. But this is the great Handini said he could do it. Well, you can imagine quite a crowd gathered. I can't imagine what it must have been like to walk a skinny wire across Niagara Falls. I've never been there, but I've seen pictures of the boiling, churning water. Here's this guy walking across this wire, and he turns around and comes back, and the crowd is cheering. And he says, who thinks I can carry a wheelbarrow, push a wheelbarrow across this wire? Everybody, you know, oh, yeah, you could do it. So he takes this wheelbarrow, and, you know, he had some fits, and, and he got across, and then he com comes back, and, you know, everybody's cheering and cheering. And then he says, all right, how many think I could put a human being in that wheelbarrow and push that human being across? Everybody's, yeah, you could do it. Yeah, you could do it. He said, okay, who wants to volunteer? And evidently, true story, the king of Denmark was there, and he wanted to volunteer. And his associates had to pull him back, or he would have gotten into the wheelbarrow. Now, I heard Pastor Phil say, that's a Dane for you. <laughs> Pastor Phil, it's Danish background. Um, where was I? The act of faith part, it's not only saying, Lord, I know I'm broken. My tendency is toward this downward progression. But then it is getting into the wheelbarrow and letting Christ wheel us into a life of obedience and service. It's a lifestyle change. It's a change that happens when a person says, I'm done with my old way of living. That's repentance. And now I'm getting into the wheelbarrow. And Jesus, I want you to carry me. And I want to live my life based on the way you direct. Well, that's not easy in our day and age. Because we live in a day and age when people think, your religion should be whatever you make it. Pick and choose. Come up with a conglomeration of things that you think are right, and that's your religion. And now we have God telling us, no, it's my way. And you say, well, how in the world then do we strive to enter that rest and live yoked to Him and know what that means? And that's where we come to chapter 4, verse 12 the Word of God. And here we find out that in entering this rest, we must make a decision about what we think of Scripture. Because here's what he says. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow that is getting into the very motives of our heart and directing us in his way, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. He's saying, my word is so valuable that it's like a mirror. You look into it and you see yourself for who you really are. My word is like an x-ray. It reveals the troubled spots in your spine. The way to enter my rest is to know my word because my word, says God, is effective and powerful. The psalmist was so appreciative of the power of the Word of God that in Psalm 19, he wrote these words, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then he goes on to say, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. In fact, you can work your whole life, amass millions of dollars, but it pales in comparison to the value of the Scripture. I've known people, and we know people in our history of our nation who were multi, multi-millionaire billionaires whose lives were falling apart out of a desire for just one more dollar in case of Rockefeller. 
But he's saying, my word is so valuable, more valuable than gold, sweeter than honey, and honey from the honeycomb. And by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But when I say that, when I say entering his rest comes by a reflection on the scripture, I know that I have a problem even with this group. Because what you hear all week is doubt about the value of Scripture. What you hear is, isn't this just a compilation written by men who uh, were writing, you know, centuries ago and not even relevant today? I mean, I mean the, the idea you get if you tell somebody you read the Scripture is, what are you, a brainless idiot? That's what they think. They think you've lost your marbles if you take this book seriously. That's why I'm so glad that we're having uh, what we call the Intelligent Faith Conference coming. We have uh, three people coming to talk to us about the issues of faith because you don't have to kiss your brain goodbye when you start yoking yourself to Jesus. There, there is evidence about the existence of God. Did you know in our scriptures, you say oh, it's just a compilation of the writings of men. And yet, this is a book written over 4,000 years, 40 different authors, with a unified message. Do you know that there are more copies of the Bible than there are copies of Shakespeare? The Bible was written back in B.C. and first 100 years A.D. There are more copies of Scripture than there are the writings of Shakespeare who wrote in the 1600s. There is all this evidence that we have. Archaeological evidence continues to prove the reliability of Scripture. I've got some articles I can give you on the historical reliability of the Old Testament, historical reliability of the New Testament. Just talk to me. I'll give you a copy. Summary of the scholars. We're bringing in these intelligent faith uh, speakers. Uh, they'll be coming February 6 and February 7, Friday night, Saturday morning. You would do well to pay 20 bucks and come to that because your friends and your family members doubt the validity of Scripture. They see no value in it. And when they ask you questions, like, are there really space aliens and, you know, how the, were the pyramids built by the eight? You need to have answers for those kinds of questions. Your kids are going to ask you these. Now, <clears throat> I would hasten to say that there was one famous preacher who spoke the truth about the Bible. He says, you know, the Bible's like a lion, and you don't need to defend the lion. And that's true. The Scripture in and of itself has power and effect. But if you really care about your neighbors and want to give a reasonable explanation of the faith that's within us, as 1 Peter 3.18 says, then you owe it to yourself. Just to spend. We're going to invite one of those speakers, Dr. Frank Turek, to speak to us on the evening of February 7 and Sunday morning, February 8. He wrote a book called, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And our teenagers are studying that right now. We're gonna, and that's going to be a great weekend. So I hope you can be a part of it. The scripture is powerful and effective. And, and God says, you need to be yoked to me. Put yourself into scripture. Read it. Believe it. Make a decision to believe it and obey it. Because, verse 13, we are all accountable to Him. Here we find the rhythm of God. Look at verse 13 again. No creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Someday, the president of North Korea will stand before the living God and answer for his actions. Exposed. Someday, President Obama will stand before our God. Someday, you and I will stand before our God, open and exposed. And his question for us is, did you realize that I created you? I created you in my image. I created you to enjoy my rest. I gave you an opportunity to enter into the rest today on the basis of the death and resurrection of my son. I gave you my word, which is my love letter, pouring out my love upon you as you read it and study it. 
Alex Mendez is the Director of Immigrant Services for the Evangelical Free Church in America. Alex, classmate of mine in graduate school, grew up in a home without a dad, single mom. For the first few years of his life, he didn't know anything about God, but then a friend introduced him to Jesus. And he trusted in Jesus as his Savior, began to walk with Jesus, and he wrote a blog the other day that I happened to read on how the Scripture has impacted his life for 39 years. He said, you know, the Word of God, it's like the parable of the soils. The farmer goes out and he throws the seed. The farmer is God. The seed is his message. Nothing wrong with the farmer, nothing wrong with the seed. But some of that seed falls on the hard path, and people are so hardened, the birds take it off. The devil takes it. And he said, some people's hearts are like shallow soil. They're shallow people. And the Word of God goes in a little bit, and it begins to take life, and they have some interest. And then the sun bakes it to death, and they fall away. And he said, then there's this third kind of soil. And it goes into the ground, and it begins to grow up, but then the thorns come, the worries of this world, the pursuit of riches, the search for happiness in all the wrong places. And he says, it withers and dies. Same farmer, same word, different kinds of soil. And then it landed in the fourth soil. And it took root, and it grew up. And this soil, this heart of a human being was open and responsive. And he said, I determined I wanted to be that fourth soil. And so for 39 years, he's read through the Bible, oftentimes with somebody else. And he said, I came up with 10 values that the Bible has for me. Here's the 10. And it gives me faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. It created a good life. He said, I was a, a, a boy who grew up without a dad, but I found a God who would give me prosperity and success, as it says in Joshua 1.8. It helps discern motivations, looks into the hearts of thoughts and intentions. He said, it's part of being a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, obeys His Word. He said, it's part of the whole way the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Further, he said, number six, there's a blessing for reading it. Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is the man or woman who reads the Scripture and applies what it says. John 17.17, 17, he says, it's the truth. It always tells me the truth. John 17.17. 17. He said, it keeps me pure. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against you. He said, it breaks down every resistance to God because the word is like a hammer and like fire. And he said, God's words are life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Can I say something to you? God has a New Year's resolution for you. It's to enter his rest. Strive to enter it. Are you entering it? The place to start is to come to him. And honestly admit, you need help. Get into the wheelbarrow and let Jesus yoke you to the walk of life. Make a decision about Scripture that despite what your friends say, you're going to believe it, read it, assimilate it, and obey it. And then daily give yourself to the reading of Scripture. Alex says, pick somebody and say, hey, you want to read the scripture with me? And just take a few minutes, maybe once a week. Read through some scripture, talk about what it means, what it means to you, and pray about it. This is striving to enter. And today is the day. What will your response be? Thirty-nine years, Alex has read the Bible, and God has given him amazing ministry. When he grew up in poverty as a single parent home, 
probably nobody thought he'd amount to anything, but God had a different plan for him. It was a plan that involved a Sabbath rest. Now, I would encourage you as we close in prayer that maybe the first step for you would be to go out into the lobby, find JoLynn Glanzer, and sign up for the Intelligent Faith Conference. She'll be out there. She can help you with that. Secondly, you might look for somebody that you could say, I want to read the Bible with you. Can we get together once a week and read it? And third, make a decision to read the Bible and think about it in private devotions every day. Even Aristotle understood this. Aristotle said, what we repeatedly do is what we are. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit, striving to enter the rest of God. Isn't that good news? If you're a Christian, you delight in a message like this. If you're not a Christian yet, this might be a very frightening message to you. We'd like to help you with this. This is a great church to do that. We have Christianity Explored. You can come and explore this, and you will not face judgment or criticism. No question is too stupid. Come and let's learn together because we have a great Christ. Let's stand, shall we? Father, thank you for your word. It's living and active. And I would pray that uh, we all might take this word seriously. Forgive us for making you so small, trivializing you. May we come and admit we need you. Come and work in us, Lord. Change us. Give us hope. Most of all, give us your rest. In Jesus' name, amen. God has one New Year's resolution for you and for me. Strive to enter his rest. I'm going to stick around if you'd like to come up and talk about it or have questions. I'd love to talk to you, pray with you. For the rest of us, three-minute guideline. I know this is hard for the introverts. And uh, if you're afraid of germs, then there are a variety of creative ways that you can greet somebody you don't know. But uh, find somebody you don't know, either shake their hand, give them a fist bump or smile, and uh, just, just welcome. Let's, let's be the family of God here and welcome each other. Let's make new friends. Let's build each other up. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and smile upon you. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.